One of the perspectives from which we can view this document and this day is through the lens of leadership, of which there are many types. The kind that I learned about in 1776 was the leadership of silence. You often hear about the leadership of courage in the field of combat or the leadership of inspiring speeches, but rarely do you hear about the leadership of silence. That is because of how quiet it is. That is not irony, by the way. <clears throat> in 1776, I was 33 years of age, one of the youngest delegates to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. The youngest were South Carolina's uh, Thomas Lynch Jr. and Edward Rutledge, who were 26 years of age at the time. Uh, actually, no, they were tied at the second youngest. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, Pennsylvania's Benjamin Franklin was the youngest. He was 70. You try keeping up with him. In contrast to the famous Dr. Franklin, I was little known. I was also quiet. During the debates on independency, members of Congress had taken sides. They had done so with passionate conviction, which they expressed at great length. Speeches on the floor of Congress lasted for hours. But I never gave a single speech in the building that you now know as Independence Hall. I listened and I took notes. Just as there are different ways of listening, there are different ways of taking notes. I did not take notes to formulate a clever retorts or to point out the flawed logic of my opponents. Instead, I took notes to improve my understanding of what everyone, even those with whom I disagreed, was saying in any dispute over how to solve a commonly agreed upon problem. If there is a person that all sides of the dispute have seen to be earnestly listening and endeavoring to understand all points of view, the entire group will be most likely to entrust that person with the task of bringing them all together to solve the problem by consensus. By my silence and attentiveness, I proved to the rest of the Continental Congress that I was that person. I worked alone for two and a half weeks in June. The committee made a few changes at the end of the month. Then, over the two days of July 2nd and July 3rd, <clears throat> Congress ruined it. In the end, they made about 85 changes and removed about 20%. I was furious about it. I never got over it. Almost 50 years later, when referring to the changes that Congress had made to the draft of the Declaration of Independence, I referred to them as mutilations and depredations. I nonetheless remained silent at the time. Oh, John Adams defended every word of it. He was truly a colossus of independence. Part of the reason that I remained silent was that if John Adams is speaking for you, you will hardly get a chance to fit a word in edgewise. But that wasn't my only reason for remaining silent as they hacked and chopped at my work. I knew that America was facing a great crisis. It was such a profound crisis that we could solve it only as one people with one mind. A simple majority would not do. And of course, the dominance of the minority's will would cause the machine to retrograde. I knew that we had to use compromise to achieve consensus. I could have stuck to my principles on any one of the alterations Congress made, refusing to compromise when I believed that I was right. Then I would have been able to brag that I had planted my feet and refused to give in. But a braggart is no leader. If I had done that, if we had behaved like that, we would have failed. The result would have been that none of our posterity would care which ones of us had stubbornly refused to sacrifice a little of their opinion or convenience in order to seek consensus for the good of all. Because we would have failed in our revolution and been branded as traitors. What's worse? Had we refused to seek consensus together in that great crisis, we would have deserved being called traitors. If not against Great Britain, then against the hopes of future generations. So I kept my mouth shut until it was time to speak for everyone. And when that time came, I did not use it as an excuse or opportunity to speak for myself alone, to promulgate my own personal opinion, nor did I use that opportunity to speak for my faction. I used that moment to speak for a consensus. I used that moment to speak for the United States of America. John Adams said that in 1776 we had to get 13 clocks to strike at once. Perhaps with your modern machinery, you don't think of that as a very great challenge, but at the time, getting even two clocks 
to strike in perfect unison was an extremely difficult task. I know. I know it has been brought to my attention that most, if not all of you, carry on your persons devices that can tell time in minute synchronicity with one another. What's more, they give you miraculous and nearly instantaneous access to the collected wisdom and knowledge of mankind. It has also been brought to my attention that most of you use these wonderful contrivances for the purposes of arguing with strangers and looking at pictures of cats. <clears throat> Before you chuckle at the quaintness of my metaphor, however, and at how primitive our technology in my day was compared to yours, consider this. You have multiplied the clocks. You have improved the chronological precision. But have you really improved your ability to get all of your clocks to strike as one, as we did in 1776? Have you improved your ability to work together in a crisis for a common cause, not just for your own good, not merely for your own personal liberty, but for the good of all, for the liberty of all, for the United States of America. In the end, we produced an admittedly imperfect result, but one with which we could proceed as one people. It brought us closer together, which means it did not split us further apart. The reason that you and so many in the United States are making an effort to listen to my words now is because of how quiet I was in 1776. And that, good citizens, is irony. <laughs>